Good evening and welcome to the 2020 Simulation and Game Development Student Capstone Presentation. COVID Edition. Now, my name is Ken Turner and I'm the lead instructor for this final project class. I would like to welcome you all here for this enjoyable experience. Now, obviously the world and everything that we were used to has changed in the past few months due to the rise of the COVID-19. Since March, adjustments had been made for the safety of both the faculty and our students and all of our classes moved to an online format. Well, for the summer, that's remained the same. Um, so obviously, we have some new unique challenges with the equipment, connection issues, um, time management skills, a whole bunch of different things that the students weren't really used to dealing with when they have that on-campus environment. Um, however, uh, this also produced a lot of opportunities for the students to learn and practice and work in a remote environment. Now, many jobs due to the COVID have changed to a totally remote format. Um, there's articles all the time about how companies are cutting back and probably going to get rid of their buildings and their office space and stay online. Now, these soft skills are very important. Now, this class, to give you a little history of this class, um, this class is ran sim very similar to a corporate environment. Each team is considered a development team. And every week we tend to have, uh, we have our leads meetings and any feedback or anything like that we need to have um, are done in an entire separate meeting. We have complete team meetings um, where I meet with each individual team, everybody on that team, and we talk and discuss what goes on. And the goal is to simulate that next step, that next step of these students moving on to a corporate environment, to a project, to an actual job. And this showcases the culmination of their career here at Wake Tech, uh, especially in the simulation and game development curriculum. This year we have nine total teams that are going to demonstrate their use of both the Unity and the Unreal engines. Uh, in the projects they created, some games and some simulations. Um, overall, the teams come into this class and have to create a full game or simulation or demo in nine weeks. Nothing can be brought in this class. Uh, the only thing that can be brought in are design docs. So every asset, um, all coding, everything like that has to be done within that nine week period. Needless to say, even in the best of times, this class can be challenging and very stressful. Um, all of the teams this year uh, were successful in getting to that finish line and being able to present their projects and everything they've worked so hard on. Uh, I would like to, before we launch into the presentations this evening, um, I would like to take a second and thank everyone for tuning in to see the presentation uh, on this YouTube stream and remind you now that in the description of the YouTube video each team has a website listed. This website allows you to interact with the teams, get in touch with the teams, download their games, play their games, um, you can send them emails and some will even have uh, after parties where they stream uh, and answer questions about the game and play uh, the game live. Uh, so uh, all the links have been provided to that as well. So uh, without further ado, we're going to go ahead and kick this off. Uh, our first team uh, created a game called Ozus the Coyote's Call. So again, I present to you Ozus, the Coyote's Call. Hi, my name is Jonah Thomas. I'm the team lead, blueprint engineer, and gameplay programmer. Hi, I'm Jordan Nald. I am the 2D artist and the 3D asset artist. 
Hi, I'm Michaela Carson. I'm the 3D character artist and the animator. Hi, I'm Christian Garnier. I'm a level designer and blueprint engineer. In our third-person action game, you awaken in a haunting world where nature is the enemy. Using your magical bow, you must fight your way through waves of twisted animal creatures to face their hidden puppet master, the trickster coyote known as Ozus. Please enjoy this trailer for our game made in Unreal Engine, Ozus the Coyote's Call. Once again, I'm Jonah Thomas. I'm the team lead, uh, blueprint engineer, and gameplay programmer for Ozus. Um, some things that I'm really proud of uh, with this project were uh, the camera transitions and the aiming system for the game. Um, our game started off as more of a twin stick top down shooter style game, and we kind of slowly pivoted over to more of a third person action style. Uh, and with that came a lot of changes with how our camera works. Uh, but in the end, I'm, I'm very proud of what we ended up with. Um, there were a lot of uh, little moving pieces and, and things that had to work together for that to come out as smoothly as it did. And again, I'm, I'm very proud of the, the work that we were able to do there. Um, another thing is the uh, destruction. Uh, we have these waystones. You can actually see them here in our, our backgrounds. But uh, these waystones in the game are, are kind of a destructible uh, part of the environment uh, that you encounter as you go through the world. And it was very important that those have a, a relatively realistic kind of uh, destruction system to go with them. Uh, and learning Unreal's destruction was uh, a challenge, but definitely something that I'm proud of the outcome for. Um, and on that note, uh, Unreal Engine in general is not something that any of us here on the team were, were super familiar with. Um, and as the you know lead programmer, um, I I think I spent probably the most time going through a lot of tutorials and, and tutorials and tutorials to uh, learn as much as I could about the, the engine that we were using. But in the end, I'm very proud of the challenge that all of us overcame to get very familiar with the Unreal Engine and all the systems that we ended up using uh, within it. Hello again. I am Jordan Alt. Um, primarily, I was the 2D artist as well as the 3D asset artist. I also did things such as the menu, the audio, the cutscenes, and the trailer. And I also did scripting. Um, the scripting was actually really fun for me because I, I enjoy writing a lot. And so that gave me like this personal touch in a way. And it helped connect the trailer with the game. Um, one thing I am really proud of is the aesthetics because 
going into this project, when we had the initial concept, I had this picture of what we could do and how it could turn out. But in the end, it turned out a lot better than I thought it would because it was more fleshed out. And another thing that I'm really proud of is the animations. Um, I didn't do the animations, Michaela did. But seeing the characters come to life made it more surreal and look a lot cooler than I thought it would because the character's alive. And um, one of the challenges that I definitely had was making sure to find a, a workaround for technology because my computer was really faulty in this whole pro process. And so that was one thing. And making sure the art lined up with the, the 2D art and the 3D art, that was a real big merging point and to figure out how to do that. But in the end, I think I'm really proud of that because it shows that nothing's really impossible and we can, we can do it if we really try. Hi, so once again, I'm Michaela Carson. I did all the uh, 3D character art and the animations, rigging, and I also assisted in the level design as well. Uh, so one thing that really went well throughout this entire project was the aesthetics of the game overall. Uh, watching it come to life from Jordan's uh, concept art to the 3D levels and everything laid out was just a really magical feeling, and it was also making the game as magical as possible. That's the whole point of it. Uh, I'm really proud of how the animations ended up coming out, especially the character animations, the main player. Uh, the bow was really fun to animate and model at the same time, since that's something I'm also passionate about. Uh, I also did the lighting and the particles and the levels as well, and seeing those come together and really give the entire level like a whole new life was really entertaining for me. Uh, throughout all this, the challenges for me were, were really keeping the particles lag down. Too many particles would cause so much lag, and keeping that balance was quite difficult. Uh, and then optimizing the levels as well has been a small challenge I've had to come over as well. Once again, my name is Christian Gardner. I'm a level designer and blueprint uh, engineer. For me, a big challenge was before this... Uh, the only levels I really designed for were for first-person shooters. So coming in and designing a level for originally a top-down twin-stick shooter and then pivoting to a third-person uh, action game was slightly new for me. But I am proud of how I was ha able to get the levels to come out to uh, affect the gameplay. And I'm really happy... That I had such uh, great artists and programmers to help, like give me the assistance in building these levels, because I can design a level as much as I want with the train tool, but if I don't have good enough assets to make it, it would just be a blank slate. And if I don't have good enough uh, programmers there, there's no gameplay there. So I'm I'm really proud of how it all turned out, and I'm really happy to have had such a great team working with me. Thank you again for your time. I hope we've piqued your interest in our game. If you'd like to download it and try it out, uh, there will be a link to our itch.io page down in the description of this live stream video, um, as well as a link to a live stream that we will be hosting when this presentation is over, where you can come and ask us any questions you might have about the development of our game. On behalf of Studio Vorfall and the Simulation Game Development Program, thank you again for your time, and we hope that you enjoy our game. Okay, that was Ozeus, the Coyote's Call. Pretty good project from one of our smaller teams. Um, those changed creatures were pretty cool, though. Uh, I really like those. Now we're going to move on to the team that created a game called Nightmares. So here's Nightmares. Hello, everyone. We are Caffeinated Felines, and we are excited to have you here with us for this virtual event. My name is Nathan Lembo, the team lead for our group, and we are here today to present our game known as Nightmares. Nightmares is a short puzzle mystery game with some first-person action and a dash of spooky elements. We wanted to try our hand at a game that allowed moments for the player to both solve problems and perform combat, hence the mixture of puzzles in the FPS genre. We hope you enjoy our game and we are excited for your feedback. But in the meantime, I'd like to introduce to you the team members who worked with me to make this game possible, both diligently and passionately. 
Let me first start off with the programming team, and more specifically, Brian Manello. Hey, my name's Brian. I was on the programming side of this project, and I had the opportunity to work with a lot of wonderful people. My primary focus was creating a player pawn with a dynamic inventory system to pick up the weapons and a plethora of pickup items throughout the map. I'm Michael Nowak. I worked on programming on the UI and made some puzzles. I was assistant in the puzzles. Hi, I'm Michelle Wong. I was the primary puzzle programmer and designer. That was our programming team. They worked hard to make sure that the gameplay mechanics that in our game were to hopefully everyone's liking. And they worked very passionately on making sure that the game design and level flow were fun as well. For now though, I would like to move on to the art team who worked on the visual and graphical aspects of our game as well as the design. I'd like to start off with Jordan Powell, their lead. Hey, my name is Jordan Powell and I am the art lead for the Caffeinated Felines. I worked alongside Nathan, but my primary focus was 3D modeling, texturing, texturing, and level design. Hi, my name is Miguel Vega. I worked on the concept art for Nightmares, from the design of the house to the weapons and props inside. I also got my hands on menu items and the phone's UI. Hi. I'm Megan McBride, and I did the background music for the game. Hi, everyone. I am Joni Sanchez, and I was the character modeler and animator for our game, Nightmare. This was a game that was put together with an amazing group of individuals. Um, we had so much fun making this, and we really hope you guys enjoy this. We once again appreciate your time and interest, and without further ado, please sit back and enjoy our trailer for Nightmares. Okay, that was Nightmares, a um, pretty interesting puzzle game with some mystery elements thrown in, uh, a lot of spooky effects. Um, now we're going to switch gears a little bit and we're going to move on to our uh, first single person team. Uh, this particular person uh, created a simulation called Workbench. Enjoy.
Hi everyone, my name is Lucas Mills. Um, for my capstone project, I wanted to do something a little different. So in lieu of a traditional game, I wanted to make uh, something of a templated project built in the Unreal Engine 4. Um, as you saw in the trailer, it is a 3D product customizer in a way. Um, the two main targets I had in mind when developing this tool were uh, product designers and game developers, just traditional game developers. Um, I feel like as a product designer you want to be able to display your product in an attractive and uh, visually accurate way. And on top of that if it's got uh, various configurations and different parts and colors and things you want people to be able to choose from, Workbench can be a standalone solution to presenting all of these options and allow your product to be built right in front of whoever's using it. Uh, on the flip side, Workbench can also be implemented as kind of an out-of-the-box solution for a game developer in an existing Unreal Engine project. Um, anyone that wants to add a dynamic crafting mechanic to a game that might already be in development. Um, what's advantageous about both of these potential users is that in both cases most of the actual assets such as like a product's CAD data or uh, craftable meshes for a game they're already complete. Y you need them for the game so it's kind of just a plug-and-play drag-and-drop uh, implementation into Workbench's existing framework. For those that don't know me, I am an avid user of the Unreal Engine 4 and of Blender. Um, if I have a chance to talk about either of them, I don't usually pass up that opportunity, which is probably one of the single most exciting things about this project because I got to spend about a solid eight weeks doing nothing but working in both of those tools. Um, I started learning them probably about 12 years ago, trying to gain as much familiarity with the workflows of the Unreal Development Kit uh, and Unreal Engine 4 when it became available. And uh, although the results weren't always pretty, the uh, instructors at Wake Tech have helped me really shape a more solid foundation, um, at least for my knowledge in the game development industry which is ultimately what led me to choose to do a, a solo project. I wanted to see how well all of those elements of that foundation would fit together when it came down to it. Um, and although there are plenty of improvements that I would like to make to the workbench, uh, it really gave me a chance to expand that understanding and, and kind of go my own way with it. I like to dabble in everything uh, regarding design and development. I love learning new engines, new tools, um, trying to apply new techniques to improve my personal workflow. So for the past few years, um, my main focus has been on technical art. And for those that don't know what that is, it's kind of like that bridge between the creative side and the calculated side. And I like to explore both because it helps you define your own workflow. Um, you know, I'm notorious for working on about a dozen projects simultaneously, but I feel like when you're under you know, pressure of working on several different things. If you get burnt out on one, you can kind of switch gears, take a breather on, on that aspect, and work on something else. And that kind of helps organize how you are structuring the project as a whole. Workbench was a great opportunity to kind of get a taste of all these different pipelines. There's 
a bunch of things that went into it, such as complex shaders and animations, um, data-driven logic. Uh, it really gave me a chance to focus all of my effort seeing this project's development through to the end and, and bringing these multiple facets together to see a completed project. Um, although I tried to focus a lot of effort in cosmetics, ultimately the dynamic functionality of this framework I feel like really brought Workbench together. Um, and the Unreal Engine is a great tool for achieving a modular and efficient workflow and being able to build on that. Uh, I did have plans to use some of the newer uh, Unreal Engine 4 systems such as the Niagara uh, visual effects as well as the Chaos Destruction Engine. Um, they didn't quite make it in right now but I did still get to play with some of the new features and uh, optimizations that Epic has recently introduced in some of the uh, Unreal Engine updates. Uh, mainly being some new uh, blueprint functionality. The entirety of Workbench was developed using blueprint scripting. Um, for those that don't know what that is, it's a visual scripting system. There's no actual code being written. Um, now, I am proficient with several programming languages, C++ being one of them, but I, I love blueprints. Uh, I will always use blueprints if I get that chance. Um, it's extremely modular and optimized. You can kind of build on your own blueprints with other blueprints. It's, it's a lot of fun to mess around with different avenues uh, using the blueprint scripting system. Um, most of the time when I'm working on something, I end up figuring out how to fix something else from previous projects, which is kind of funny. Uh, Workbench wasn't actually my original concept for my final project. Uh, without going into too much detail, um, earlier in the year I was kind of prototyping a, an idea for my capstone project, and uh, ended up coming across something that I thought was just a limitation of blueprints. Um, turns out I just wasn't looking at it the right way, but about two or three weeks into the development of Workbench, I came across a similar issue and then solved it, and then basically it, it rendered my previous project completely doable. So kind of have one of those eureka moments and then yeah it's a little too late but did have a lot of fun so either way if you see me after this presentation that's probably what I'll be working on next that simulation was called workbench um, pretty interesting simulation uh, obviously you can construct some different products in this case we had a lamp going uh, really good effects throughout um, pretty nice now we're gonna go back to uh, some entertainment style games uh, this one we're playing in a backyard so I present to you lady the backyard adventure it was a sleepy day in the backyard under the deck the ladybug village was just beginning to stir little did they know the danger lurked just around the corner
Hamilton, and I served as team lead for Lady the Backyard Adventure, as well as designing the game's overall user experience, logo, and trailer. Hi, my name is Andrew Fletcher. I was the lead programmer on Lady. I created all of the code for the game and many of the blueprints used to control different aspects of gameplay. Hi, my name is Jason Corbin. I was one of the level designers on the project and the main environmental artist. Hi, my name is Derek Spicer. I was the main world designer, narrative writer, a level designer, sound effects editor, and in-game cinematics director for this game. Hi, I'm Nathaniel Riley. I'm the 3D character of the game. I modeled, textured, and animated the main characters, the enemies, and the bosses based on designs by Jason. Lady of the Backyard Adventure is an action-adventure game about a tiny ladybug determined to save her village from the suddenly sentient plants threatening to overtake it. Explore different locales within a child's backyard, defeating enemies and collecting items to increase your score. It's up to the player to unravel the mystery of this new vegetative threat and take down the evil forces at work. We'd like to share with you some of our experiences making the game. Around 80% of the game was made with a C++ and the other 20% came from blueprints. Uh, having only minor experience with C++ before I started this project, this made this uh, pretty challenging, but I got a feel uh, for it pretty quickly and I was able to make a solid code base for the game. Uh, what I enjoyed most about this project was learning how to create a boss fight. I spent quite a bit of time refining and testing the fight to make sure it was challenging yet still fun. Uh, learning how st uh, to string mechanics together in a way to create a fight that smoothly transitioned was a grind, but I'm happy with the result. Another aspect I enjoyed was creating a game with both keyboard and mouse and controller input. This led to a lot of challenges that only uh, using one input wouldn't have, but I figured out uh, how to make both work together. It was a great learning experience overall. Uh, yes, uh, I really enjoyed creating the world that Lady lives in. This was an amazing experience bringing all the components together, modeling, texturing, and just making a realistic yet imaginative environment for you to explore. Uh, one of my most challenging and enjoyable parts of the project was creating the pool level. Some of the items I can't mention because you're just going to have to play them to see, but uh, making the realistic water texture was just a self-accomplishment for me. From the initial idea of having a ladybug navigating a real-world-esque backyard, size difference and all, I created the world white box that became the basis for our three main levels plus the initial village setting. Later into production, I took ownership of the second level, the sandbox level. A sandbox within a sandbox sculpted to emphasize platforming and exploration with a within a hostile uh, desert-like environment. Well, desert-like for a ladybug anyway. I created or edited most of the sounds found within the game, helping foment a playful yet challenging atmosphere for the player as they guide Lady through the backyard. The cinematics that bookend the game alongside the in-game transitions guiding the player between the levels are the narrative threads that tie the game together. What I learned during this project emphasized the famous quote, plans are useless, but planning is indispensable. Our group's effective communication allowed us to make the necessary changes we needed throughout development. Our emphasis on iteration and willingness to adapt resulted in our group's success. Creating these characters was an interesting experience. I had not stylized characters like this before. I'd always tried to steer towards the realistic. This project allowed me to explore a different method of modeling. I also tried a different workflow where I sculpted the characters and tried to retopologize over them afterward. I think I'll continue with that workflow as I really enjoyed it. This experience has inspired me to explore multiple styles of modeling as I move forward in my career. For me, um, designing the, how a game will flow as well as the user interface and experience of a game is one of my favorite parts of the game development process. Being the connection between player and gameplay can be a bit nerve wracking since if the player doesn't understand the gameplay loop or misses a control, they might quit before ever seeing the hard work put into the rest of the game experience. The key thing I had to learn in this project was how many different elements all get combined when designing that experience, like keeping the UI's art style consistent with Jason and Derek's environment and Nathaniel's characters, or working with Andrew on how a specific piece of gameplay would be programmed and how to communicate that information to the player. Uh, considering the tiny amount of time we had to put together this project, I'm really proud of my team for being able to create such a cohesive vision that stayed pretty true to our concept from start to finish. 
And that's pretty much it. I hope you enjoyed learning more about Lady the Backyard Adventure. And if you want to try the game for yourself or learn more about us, feel free to check out our website in the description below. It has all of the links you could possibly need. Um, additionally, we'll be hosting our very own live stream right after the event where we're going to demo the game and be chatting with you guys. So feel free to drop by. And the link for that is also in our website. So thanks so much. That was Lady, the Backyard Adventure. Um, pretty cool game. Very, very fun, amusing, uh, jumping combat. Um, now we're gonna change it up a little bit. We're going to head on to another game. This one is a puzzle-based game. Uh, and I present Edge of the Abyss. Hey everyone, my name is Nasir Mohammed, and I acted as the team lead, lead programmer, and lead designer for our game, Edge of the Abyss. Howdy, my name is Trevor Collins. I'm the uh, character animator and art lead for Edge of the Abyss. Hi, my name is Alec Martinez. I'm a gameplay programmer and level designer for Edge of the Abyss. Hi, I'm Gordon, and I built this game's level editor. In Edge of the Abyss, you play the Robonaut who finds himself in a world falling apart at the seams. Armed with his cartographer's quill, he must draw his path to explore an unfamiliar terrain. Here's our trailer. Hello again, everyone. That was a trailer for our game, Edge of the Abyss. Once again, my name is Nasir Mohammed, the team lead, lead programmer, and lead designer. Edge of the Abyss started with the idea for taking minimalist art and simplistic gameplay and layering some complexity on the top of it. Uh, as the lead designer, I came up with the initial idea for the game, and I started with essentially a minimalist art piece that was all white in the background and it had a shape that was all black with a few lines to help define the shape of what it was. And we drew inspiration from essentially what Monument Valley did for figuring out their level design, where we asked ourselves, how could we navigate a character through this art piece? So we started to think about, okay, well, if we add back lines into the shape, then you're able to create essentially surfaces and platforms for a player to navigate. And we already knew at that point that we had our, our game. There, there's the puzzle right there. Being able to essentially discover the world and navigate the world that you create by drawing edges. So once we had that design idea, I began laying out the groundwork for the systems where I programmed everything where you can select the vertices as you saw in the trailer, draw the edges and create the faces that the player will then navigate. And so our puzzle aspect is essentially just exploring the silhouette of a shape which represents the uh, the level and once again drawing those faces and edges to reach the path to the goal um, 
So I also worked uh, as the team lead to tie all the game pieces together. Uh, as lead programmer, I also essentially laid down the design specs for a lot of the systems that were built on top of that core work for the, the edge and vertex and face generation system. So I helped design the face abilities, I integrated the level editor to essentially port stuff into the game, and a lot of time I was just you know playing support to my team to make sure that the process of programming and getting all their work in was as easy as possible. And I have to say that I'm most satisfied with the underlying systems of the edge drawing and face generation because designing that was definitely a programming challenge. I've never quite programmed anything like that before, and I'm glad to talk about it uh, later on with anybody in our team screen meeting uh, after this presentation. But now I'll pass it off to Trevor to talk about the aesthetics side of the game. Thank you very much, Naz. Uh, like he said earlier, uh, we wanted to go for a more minimalist and high contrast style for the game's overall aesthetics once we move past the uh, uh, initial concept designs. We wanted to make the game easy to pick up, and by having this style, we felt that it could let the gameplay speak a little bit more for itself uh, when people started playing. Uh, I personally handled the Robonauts design and animations. Uh, we wanted to make the Robonaut feel like a kid exploring this unfamiliar world, uh, so we designed them a, a, as a very small character with a lot of round features to make them more appealing. The animations also, we made them a lot more weighty than a robot might usually do. Uh, it helped feel less robotic, a little bit more organic, and it made them a lot more of a relatable character. Uh, we wanted to make the Robonaut feel as appealing to control as possible. Uh, while you were exploring this unfamiliar world. Uh, here's Alec to give some more details about that world and how it's generated. Hi, my name is Alec again. Um, so uh, one of the most important features of being able to navigate the world are the face abilities that you've seen in the trailer. So these were decided early on and were a core part of the design. They uh, really complemented the aesthetic and gameplay goals that we had set out. Um, it was inspired strongly by abstract art with uh, strong contrasting colors as well as just simple geometric shapes. Um, the main challenge for me was making a system that would be um, flexible enough to be easily implemented even if you didn't understand the full code. Um, and I think that turned out all right. Um, one of my other uh, duties was to design levels, which was made a lot easier once we had the uh, wonderful editor that Gordon had made. And I'll hand this off to Gordon to talk about that. Uh, I made the editor, and this is the first one I've ever made using a JSON save and load system. I made editor editors before, and they've used text files before, but this time I've used JSON to pull out the master. This game is built mostly out of cubes, so the core of this editor is adding and deleting cubes with the mouse. And there's also a painting system where you can paint these cubes with material which you uncover in the actual play. And I also made the materials for this. And there's also a background system where you can add background and change their colors. I also changed the silhouette system. And from the editor you can also set the abilities that you use in the game, like extrude and teleport. All right, guys, that wraps up everything about Edge of the Abyss, uh, all the work that my amazing team did. Working on this has been quite the journey. We faced a lot of challenges, whether it be aesthetically, programmatically, any type of challenge you can think of, we faced it. And we also overcame it. And because of that, I'm very proud of the product that I have to show you guys today. Uh, on behalf of Intangible Studios, my team, we'd like to say thank, thank you. you for playing thank our game. Playing our game. <laughs> uh, you can tap into our stream that we'll be having after everybody else presents their game. Once again, thank you, thank you. Nice touch on some of the maps for Edge of the Abyss. Very interesting method for creating the paths, and the game comes with a map editor. Nice touch. Now, the next project takes us in again a different direction than the puzzle games uh, this is the second of the single person teams uh, so I present to you the game called low fighter 
Good evening, I'm Dan Evans. I'm the solo member of Team Uproar Gaming, and the game I'm showing you this evening is called Low Fighter. It's a 3D fighting game that I made that offers a casual experience, some low fidelity beats, and some stylistic artwork. Uh, we're going to uh, switch over to a trailer here, and when we get back, I'll explain some of the work that I put into making it. Thanks. Welcome back. Hope you enjoyed the uh, trailer there. Uh, Low Fighter is a bit of a passion project for me. Uh, going through school, I've spent a lot of time listening to lo-fi music as I worked on uh, my various school projects. Um, fighting games have always been something I enjoyed a lot, and uh, this was a tribute to one of my favorite ones, an uh, old game called Power Stones. It was put out for the Dreamcast. I uh, had a lot of fun making it, uh, definitely uh, stressful, a lot of work went into it. Um, there was some uh, fun stuff I got to uh, play around with that I hadn't got to try before, uh, specifically uh, doing a lot of work with Unity Rigid Bodies and uh, creating my own character controller. Uh, definitely some challenges there. Um, in particular, uh, Unity has a new input system that was a little bit tricky to implement. Uh, and of course, uh, a lot of work went into uh, creating the models, the animations, really just getting everything up and running. Uh, definitely a, a great learning experience, had a lot of fun making it um, in the future. I could see myself maybe taking some time to flush it out a little bit more, add a few more characters, add a few more levels, uh, maybe even add network co-op. But for now, uh, considering it was made over the course of 10 weeks, quite happy with the way it turned out. And I hope you all get a chance to uh, download it and uh, have a stab at playing it. There's currently not any enemy AI or network experience, so if you do want to play it, you'll have to grab a buddy and actually be playing on the same system. Hopefully that's not too much trouble, but I think you'll have fun if you get a chance to do so. Uh, thanks for listening to my pitch and taking a look at my game. I appreciate it. My name's Dan Evans. This is Uproar Gaming, and uh, you can find some more information about what I've done and download the game at HIO. I believe Ken has the link for that. Thank you. That was Low Fighter. Low Fighter gives us a little bit more movement, um, a little faster pace, um, some some breakable objects to throw. It's always good to beat the crap out of somebody. Um, now we're going to get into a shooting style game. So I present to you New Pike Showdown. Howdy, everybody. Uh, first off, I want to thank everyone for coming and tuning into the SGG 2020 uh, Capstone live stream. Uh, I know I speak for the rest of us when I say it does mean a lot for y'all to be here. Uh, we've been working really, really hard over the past 10 weeks, and we're pretty proud of what we made. So we're happy to, for people to be seeing and playing it. Um, that being said, uh, our game is New Pike Showdown. Um, New Pike Showdown is a third-person shooter slash tower defense uh, game, and it takes place in New Pike. Uh, New Pike is one of the most valuable gold mines in the galaxy, and with that comes a lot of uh, invaders wanting to come in and get their hands on the gold. So you'll take the role of uh, the sheriff for New Pike, and you'll have to utilize five unique weapons and place uh, three different types of turrets to help slow down the prospector and his robotic minions. So, uh, that being said, let's saddle up and uh, take a look at the trailer.
Welcome to New Pack, a humble little town on the dusty rock heap of a planet. One of the most valuable gold mines in the galaxy, but our little secret's starting to spread around. Rumors are starting to spread that the prospector's planning something big, that he may be trying to take the town in the mine for himself. That's right, Roman. I'm the sheriff of this here town, and I'd be damned if I let it fall. Especially not some creepy old man with a bunch of scrap box. Let's see how those bots like a little more firepower. We got big guns, small guns, short guns, long guns, whatever you want. So try your best, Prospector. Looks like New Pike is about to see a showdown. <laughs> Now I can get used to this. All right, I hope everybody enjoyed that uh, awesome trailer for the game. Um, so we're going to go ahead and introduce ourselves. Uh, my name is Jordan Hartman, and I'm the team lead for New Pike Showdown. I was also a 3D modeler, animator, and I also did all the voice acting in the game. Hi, my name is James Stevens. Uh, I was the one of the programmers for our team. I also worked on a lot of the in-game cinematics, the cutscenes mostly, and a lot of the functionality for our user interface. Hello, my name is Noah Tenney. I was the other programmer for New Pike Showdown. My main contributions were developing the AI and most of the gameplay. Hello, my name is Justin Tafalowski, and I designed the audio and soundtrack for New Pike Showdown. All right, y'all. So um, Eric Gray, unfortunately, couldn't be here today. He did have to have emergency surgery for his appendix. Um, but he was a 3D, uh, 3D modeler and an animator on the game. Um, so you want to learn more about what he's done and what he did on the game, go ahead and check out the website. Hello, my name is Calvin Schneider, and I was the texture artist as well as the level designer for our game, New Pike Showdown. I did the design of how the level was laid out as well as doing textures for most of our buildings and props that you see around the map. All right, y'all, so we're gonna go ahead and do a little bit of uh, personal reflections on the game. Um, as far as I go, I think one of the things I'm really, really proud of is uh, capturing the, the essence of the characters. Um, I, I feel like the model, the animation, and uh, the voice acting for each the bartender and the, um, the main character, the sheriff, I think I did a fairly good job of um, keeping everything fitting together. Um, one thing I would have <laughs> liked to know more about going into this was just how complicated the animations were going to be as far as you, the sheriff using five different guns and how they all have to blend together seamlessly. Um, but thankfully, after learning montages and new state machines uh, within Unreal, we were able to get them working, and uh, I think they looked pretty well. But uh, for the future reference, I would like to learn more about um, setting up rigs properly to be able to work for that kind of thing in Unreal. Hey, so um, one of the things that I'm the most proud of for this game was, you know, getting the UI to work exactly the way that we needed it to. Um, figuring out, you know, there were a lot of challenges that I ran into uh, being new to Unreal relatively. Uh, I've never really used the blueprints before, so it was definitely an experience. And overcoming that is definitely something that I'm proud of. And you know, just being able to get things to operate and work. Um, something that I would like to improve on was definitely just uh, the way that I implement blueprints and get them working. Um, there were a lot of bugs. Um, well, not really a lot. It's just that there were some very persistent bugs. The screen lock, um, you know, sometimes the train didn't show up. But, you know, I managed to work through them. And, you know, the game runs pretty good now. 
Hello, everyone. Uh, I think one thing I did or I'm proud of for this project was probably developing the AI. It was really my first deep dive into like how to handle everything and just making them work really. And especially since it's like another like deep dive, my first deep dive into the blueprint system in UE4. So it was just really interesting just to see how everything coincides and works with each other. Uh, something that we can probably approve on is probably just balance in the game. It was just really one of the biggest roadblocks we had because like if the game was too easy or something didn't work properly, we'd just try to like throw something in, try to make it harder. But then if we, when we made it harder, we added more enemies and more enemies means more money for the player so they could access new weapons and like everything earlier in the game. So it was just really hard to balance everything. So that was definitely something I want to improve on in the future. So one of the things I was most proud of uh, that I personally got done was uh, the creation of the soundtrack. Um, most of the uh, music I've made in the past is more uh, electronic, and this was a blend of a Western and sci-fi feel. So it was definitely interesting to try something a bit new. Uh, it ranged from about 80 BPM to all the way up to 180, I think, for the boss fight track. Uh, that was a lot of fun to work on. Uh, one of the things I think I could have improved on a little bit more was the acquisition of uh, sources for the sound effects and that sort of thing. Um, in particular, uh, like I knew uh, one of the ideas I wanted to do is I wanted to go out, get some live fire of guns, uh, throw them through a couple of phasers, make them sound like sci-fi bullets. Um, but unfortunately, due to complications, uh, that never got done. Um, but other than that, I think I was able to pull through with the um, issues that arose, and I think it turned out pretty good. All right, and I'd like to finish off our reflections uh, talking about my challenges as the level designer and texture artist for our game. I felt like I had quite a bit of a challenge when it came to making sure that the layout of our level looked like a town that was being attacked by an army of robots as well as a new settlement on a new planet. I feel like I did a good job when it came to adding some battle-torn scars through my textures, especially on the buildings. You can see all the little uh, explosion marks and stuff around the map. I feel like one of the other big challenges that I had was as a texture artist, you have to make sure your artistic style matches everybody else's on the team that you're working on. And I feel like that really shows across our map. All right, y'all. Well, once again, thank y'all so much for coming in uh, to the live stream. Uh, it does mean a lot to us, and uh, we're honored even just to be here presenting today. Um, but that being said, if you want to go ahead and check out our website, learn more about us, uh, download the game and play it for yourself, that link will be in the description. And we will as well be live streaming as well. So if you click that link, we'll be around. Uh, if you want to tune in and ask us questions, we'll be there to answer them. All right. Thanks, everybody. And that was New Pike Showdown. Good cross between some of the Old West sort of feelings and some futuristic spin. Um, had some turrets, so we had uh, protection games. Uh, nice, very good mix. Um, now, we've had some puzzle games. We've had some shooting, some fighting. Uh, now we're going to do something with just plain mayhem. So... I invite you to check out the game Bad Dog. Hello from the present and future. My name is Jessica McKnight and I am project lead for Bad Dog by Caution Light Games. Bad Dog has been my brainchild for many years and it brings me joy to see it brought to light by the efforts of me and my team. While initially there were many uh, while well, initially there were many things planned, they had to be removed due to time constraints. But we still did well to make a fun and quick game. In a moment, you will hear from my team and some of their reactions.
Hello, my name is Jacob Hardman, and I'm the level designer, programmer, and assistant lead for Bad Dog. During the development of Bad Dog, I primarily worked on the structure and visual layouts of the levels, as well as gameplay and UI programming. Initially, I was designed to level design and UI programming. However, as the project continued, we noticed that there was a need with gameplay programming. Despite my lack of expertise in the field, I treated this as an opportunity to aid the project further. Our goal with Bad Dog was to create a fast-paced game of destruction with everyone's furry friend as the star. I wanted each level to feel as if they were designed as an actual living space, while still allowing the player to get the full experience of being a bad dog. Additionally, I wanted the UI and gameplay to be friendly to players, in order, in order to let the player enjoy the game without having to worry about how to play. As you can imagine, producing a game in nine weeks is a major source of stress. I managed to overcome this challenge through the support of my teammates whom I would like to thank. It was a pleasure working with them, and I would gladly do so again. Hey everybody, I'm Vance Barber. I am the technical animator for Caution Light Games Bad Dog. I think the hardest thing for us was de keeping deadlines, because they crept up on us a lot, even more so than what you'd expect given our nine weeks to create this game. But I think we turned out good in the end. All right. Take Hello, I'm Ben Holton, and I'm one of the 3D prop artists for Bad Dog. During development, I primarily worked on modeling and texturing the environmental props you see present within the final version of Bad Dog. For Bad Dog, we wanted to craft a cartoonish style for the game, similar to early 1950s cartoons in the same in the show, such as Tom and Jerry. Before we even start production on Bad Dog, one of my tasks on this team was to create a vertical slice of different texture styles for us to decide which texture style would work best for the project. I created several different texture scenes, each with their own unique texture style. The texture style we eventually decided on was a hand-drawn cartoon style reminiscent of MS Paint. The art style is simple, only utilizing a color, height, and opacity map to get that simple MS Paint style. While I helped play a role in designing the game's art style, my main role in the project was as a 3D prop artist. One of the main challenges I faced on Bad Dog was finding the perfect balance between creating high-quality models while still working quickly to meet deadlines. I was eventually able to find this perfect balance between these two, being able to create a majority of these 3D props you see in Bad Dog. Hello, my name is Cedar Edwards. I worked as a 3D artist and writer for Bad Dog. For writing the dog descriptions on Bad Dog, I wanted each dog to be unique. I'm actually not familiar with um, dogs and dog breeds because I don't have any dogs myself, um, but through doing some research and through watching Jessica's dogs, I figured out a way to make each dog stand out from the pack. Hello, my name is Trevor Walls. I'm one of the 3D prop artists and the texturing lead for the game Bad Dog. I was tasked with modeling and texturing props seen within the final build of our game. As the texturing lead, it was my call as to what art style would best fit the theme of the game. After a few ideas were tossed here and there, we settled upon a hand-paid style of textures for our game. When working on the game Bad Dog, I had trouble at first balancing time spent on on modeling, UV unwrapping, and texturing. Eventually, I was able to cut the time worked on UVs and even spin up my time texturing to produce three props at a much more manageable pace to develop props you see within Bad Dog. Hello, my name is Fernando, and I work on the QA team for Bad Dog Project. Hello everyone, my name is Isaiah Rothrock and I serve as the QA lead of Bad Dog. In the early stages of the game, the team and I create an Excel document to record any and all bugs, errors, and glitches we found within the game during each cycle and build. We also separated them according to the game's version so that the programmers wouldn't get confused and have an easier time fixing what was pointed out. 
We also color-coded the document in such a way that depending on the bugs found, certain team members would look into and correct them. Stress testing was something that was on my mind during the entire development cycle. Nothing could be overlooked as when it came to our game, there were many, many things that we had to fix. When it came to stress testing, everything needed to be tested in an attempt to break it. I believe the best part about stress testing comes from finding all the different quirks that came up as we tested the game. Sporadic objects and incorrect character interactions, to name a couple. Our bug list certainly helped a great deal, you know, given we ended up with many different bugs, and every version brought new issues even when we fixed other parts of the game. I think what was rather difficult about the whole process is the fact that I have been, actually never been a QA lead before, so it was a bit tricky at first, but I got used to it over time, especially since I had to, in addition to making sure that no bugs went overlooked, needed to let everyone know when the bugs was updated, which was quite often. In the end, it was a rather fun process. The directives I was given helped greatly when it came to stress testing, especially as time went on and certain aspects needed to be tested more. I certainly made an impact on my team and was helpful overall. <laughs> I'm very proud of the efforts made to bring Bad Dog to life. We've worked hard to overcome many challenges in the creation of Bad Dog. I believe that we have grown to be better developers and better teammates over the course of the summer. The online format and COVID-19 were huge hurdles. I spent many hours communicating and managing with my team over various forms of communication. The lack of physical contact and the stay home order and the truncated timeline made it super easy to lose motivation and structure. But despite these obstacles, we powered through to bring you Bad Dog. This is not the end of the story for Bad Dog by Caution Light Games. Only the beginning. The birth, if you will. And though it may be a little misshapen and ugly, what we have in store for you will positively make you pee. Thank you for joining our presentation of Bad Dog by Caution Light Games. You can find the latest version at CautionLifeGames.com. Link in the description. There, you will also find a live interview link for after this stream, and hopefully some pooper bloopers we encountered along the way. Thank you. And that was Bad Dog. How can you go wrong with a dog destroying the house? Peeing and pooping everywhere, scratching stuff, turning stuff over. Anyway, um, we're going to move along to our last submission. Uh, this one's pretty fast-moving kind of a party style game so hold on enjoy this will be kitchen clash Hey guys, this is Brandon Parton, team lead and gameplay engineer of WDB Productions. On behalf of the team, I'd like to say that we hope you enjoyed the trailer for our new game, Kitchen Clash. These last 10 weeks, we spent many hours planning, designing, drawing, developing, and bug fixing to get this game to the point it is today. Our team consists of six members who each worked hard on different aspects of this project. Uh, I'm Andrew Jennings. I was the UI programmer and UI designer. I'm Casey Balcom. I'm a level designer and audio composer. I'm Chap Jones. I was a level designer and also an audio composer. I'm Kellen Tsui, lead 2D artist and animator. I'm Sean Agnew. I worked as a 3D artist, texture artist with for the 3D assets, 
quality assurance lead, and a level design assistant. We would now like to take this time to explain in a little more detail the process we went through in order to present to you the game we have today. Hello, my name is Kellen, lead 2D artist and animator. I created a large portion of the visual assets you can see in our game, as well as the website. Namely, all of our playable characters, character animations, weapons, pickups, user interface elements, icons for character selection, other icons, and finally the menu animations. In regards to the characters we have, we have four different chefs you can play as. The ice cream chef, the hibachi chef, the pizza chef, and finally the Red Bull chef. Each of these chefs was designed around a specific type of cuisine with their own personal themes implemented in their design to give them their own personalities. As for the weapons we have, we have two main weapons, a small kitchen knife and a large cleaver. You can pick up along the way a large stick with a pizza on it, or finally a flamethrower so you can heat things up in the kitchen with your friends. I'm Sean, and I'm the lead 3D artist and quality assurance lead. The 3D assets being the models, UVs, and textures were all completed pre-alpha for the lead level designers to easily put together the levels. Each model had a poly count in mind, so they look as good as they do while keeping the game running as optimized as possible. The free time created after the models allowed me to assist the level designers and take up roles of the quality assurance lead by forming the QA document, shared with the team, and updating the bugs as soon as a new build was out. And lastly, I am also the one that put together the trailer you just watched. As you can tell, we have a culinary theme, so our levels follow that same theme. Yeah, we wanted to have each level correspond to one of the playable chefs. With each level, there's a different environmental challenge unique to that particular level. For example, the ice cream stage makes players try to avoid falling ice cream cones. If they don't, the chef will slip and fall in the mess. Our hibachi level has a live grease trap that players must avoid, along with falling shrimp and veggies. The pizza parlor has renegade pizza pies flying from the oven, an obstacle that players need to dodge unless they wanted to be knocked back. Each level also has its own unique background music that uses instruments commonly heard in its real-life environments. The hibachi level uses instruments from Asian countries, while the pizza environment uses instruments that would be heard from a live band. The ice cream level has a lot more leeway with its sound since the music is indicative of what would be played by an ice cream truck. Along with the music tracks, we also decided to implement certain sound effects in particular areas. While battling on the, on the hibachi oven, players can hear the impending doom of a sizzling grease trap below them. Pizza pies flying from the broken ovens make a particular whoosh sound to signal when players should dodge incoming projectiles. Along with the level sound effects, each weapon has its own sound effect, including the noise it makes when it makes contact with either an object in the level or with the character who all have their own vocal effects. Hey guys, my part in the project was to implement all the features our designers came up with. I did most of the programming for everything gameplay related. Players can play the game with up to four people. Currently the game supports Xbox One controllers and single player keyboard and mouse controls. The connection is local, so be sure to invite your friends over to play. Since the game can have four players, four characters were also created to complement that feature. There are four characters who all possess different shields and sound effects. Each character also has their own set of animations, which were created for movement in each cardinal and ordinal direction. This means that there are not only individual animations for movement north and south, but for directions such as northwest and southeast. Players have the ability to shield against oncoming attacks. They also have the ability to roll left and right in order to dodge attacks once their shield is run out. As mentioned by Kellen, there are currently four different weapons in the game, all with unique uses. There is a butcher knife, which acts as the classic melee weapon with a swing, a throwing knife, which can be thrown at an enemy and return on contact. A pizza on a stick, which can be swung around and then also does damage on contact. And then there is the fourth weapon, a flamethrower. These weapons can be rotated depending on the cursor position, if you're playing with mouse and keyboard, or the right joystick on a controller. The direction the weapon is facing determines where that weapon will be targeting when used. The weapons also switch hands depending on that same direction's x-coordinate. Throughout the game, these weapons will spawn randomly around the level. Any player can then proceed to pick up that weapon and use it in combat for that round. There are currently two enemy AI a player can practice against if they are playing alone. First, there is a classic player imitation AI who will follow the player around and attempt to kill them with the butcher knife and throwing knife. Second, there is an ice cream bot which will shoot ice cream balls at you from distance, but if you get too close, it will push you away with a shockwave. There are still many more small features that add to the gameplay experience, but for now, we'll move on to the UI and audio mechanics with Andrew. 
As the UI programmer, I designed and programmed the user interface. As you go through the main menu, you can progress to the tutorial. The tutorial was designed to tell the player how to play the game by having the controls pop up one by one. After the controls are done, then the tutorial really starts by making the bot able to take damage and also shoot at the player. Once the tutorial is complete, to the player can proceed to the main menu to play the game. The player can then progress to choose how many players are playing and to the character selection screen. While in gameplay, each player has nine health split between three hearts. Each heart has three parts, full heart, half heart, and quarter heart. I hope you enjoyed the exclusive gameplay and discussion from our members on the process we went through and the different features of Kitchen Clash. If you'd like to get more information regarding the game or the team who made it, please visit one of our links in the description below. We have a website and a Twitter where you can get updates regarding the game. Thanks for your time. We hope your parties and other gatherings will be more fun and enjoyable with Kitchen Clash. All right, Kitchen Clash. Um, some nice, fast-moving battle fighting um, geared towards parties and such. Now, that was our last submission. All nine teams this semester did really well with both their games and the challenges that were set forth by the class. Um, being thrown into a remote and high-stress situation at the same time, um, trying to deal with... Uh, class burdens, working, stuff like that, can be very difficult. But overall, everything seemed to go really smoothly. Now, you may have noticed that the Red Bull logo has come up a few times in the videos or the backgrounds. This is because Red Bull has been working with the Final Project class for the past couple years to help support our students and our curriculum. Each year, they take a larger and larger port part in the class itself um, and this year they provided us with some feedback for the games and access to uh, one of their professional esports athletes um, so that they could give feedback to our teams try to make better games stuff like that and we're constantly trying to work together to try to expand that to provide give them the opportunity to provide more support for our curriculum and this final project class. Now, I hope you enjoyed the games that you saw. Um, I wanted to remind everyone before we sign off that you can reach all the teams via their websites that are located in the description of this YouTube video. Um, as a reminder, some of the teams uh, are planning on streaming kind of an after party uh, after the presentations. Uh, the links that I was able to provide were provided there as well. Um, feel free to go talk to the teams on the streams, uh, interact with them via their website, email them, get in touch with them um, if you're interested in their games. Um, in closing, I wanted to thank everyone for coming viewing this video and all the support we've received throughout the semester to try to help all of these games um, come to fruition. Um, I want to especially thank uh, the Wake Tech faculty, any of the administration of Wake Tech, any friends, family, uh, Red Bull reps, or anyone else that has attended this video, um, helped any play, play testing any of the games uh, and any assistance that they help the you know students without you guys none of this would have been possible um so i again appreciate it from the bottom of my heart thank you thank you thank you um so once again thank you and have a great evening